So thank you, Jean-Francois. It's a pleasure to <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you all tonight. So let's start. The first speaker is uh, Maria Montes. Maria, come, come, please. <laughs> Maria is a. Uh, <laughs> She's a graphic designer, illustrator, and lettering artist based in Melbourne, in Australia. Her journey began in 1996 when she studied graphic design and calligraphy. And after worked for 10 years in that field, she decided to go deeper in the field and deepen in her knowledge about letter forms. So he attended a postgraduate course about um, typography, and then she moved uh, uh, to New York to study and work at the same time for one year. And nowadays, sh she's dividing her time between Melbourne and Barcelona, right? Yes. More or less? Mostly Melbourne. Mostly Melbourne. Yeah. Uh, Melbourne working uh, in graphic design, textile design, illustration, calligraphy, and lettering. Yes. So <laughs> um, the way uh, typography and um, illustration work in Maria's work and uh, influence each other is really special and unique. So I'm really, I can wait to see her keynote tonight. So please give a really warm welcome to Maria Montes. Bonsoir. Je m'appelle Maria Montes et je suis très contente d'être ici avec vous ce soir. Excusez-moi, mais je ne parlais pas bien français, donc permettez-moi de continuer en anglais maintenant. <laughs> As many of you here, I have also studied a condensed program in typeface design where Jean-François Pochès was my main instructor. <laughs> so, being here in Paris today and talking about my work and trajectory after all these years feels like a huge privilege to me. My talk today is about my love for letter forms and education, my values based on gender equality, cultural diversity and inclusion, and my personal interest in exploring the use of language as cultural identity. As a disclaimer, I must say that there will be a lot of explicit language throughout my talk and in the background slides, and I promise I will explain why later. So let's do that. I was born in Blanes, a small town 70 kilometers north of Barcelona. My parents are not designers. They don't have a uni degree and have never been interested in traveling out of the country. My mother was born in a remote village of around 200 people, five kilometers from the Portuguese border. We used to go to Galicia every year, and I loved it with all my heart. At home, I spoke Castilian Spanish with my parents. At school, I spoke Catalan. And during my summer holidays in Galicia, I wanted to speak Galego, as I fully understand the language. In Galicia, I was the Catalan kid, and in Catalonia, I felt I was the Galician one because everyone told me my accent was a weird mix. Well, things have not changed that much. My accent today, as you can tell, is uh, still pretty strong. My doctor in Barcelona calls me the Australian and my doctor in Melbourne calls me the Spaniard. So I'm in between walls <laughs> still. My father was raised in an immigrant family who traveled from the south of Spain to Catalonia looking for work. My grandparents had very limited resources and decided to offer the oldest kid the opportunity of going to high school followed by university. My uncle wasn't interested in the offer so declined. So my father put his hands up as he really wanted to study and became a draftman. My grandparents did a didn't let my father study as the offer was only given to the oldest son. My father started working at the age of 14 and have just recently retired at the age of 65. He always told us that he had been denied the luxury of education. So he was, he was gonna be always making sure 
that my brother and I had access to it. I studied a Bachelor of Arts in Graphic Design. Being admitted at a private university put me in an environment I had never been in touch before. I met people that came from very wealthy families, some of them highly educated, some of them highly arrogant, but some of them extremely life experience. In my first year at university, I met a girl who totally challenged my perspective. She was only 18 years old, but had traveled around the world, spoke several languages, and was in a long distance relationship with a guy from New York City. Her life seemed like a movie to me. Geraldine and I connected instantly and became close friends. I helped her to translate the content of our classes from Catalan to Spanish, and she opened up the entire world to me. Thanks to Geraldine's influence, at the age of 23, I flew out of Spain for the very first time. New York City was love at first sight. It was everything I had imagined and more, but at that time I couldn't speak English and I felt I wasn't ready for it. Back in Barcelona, I started to dream about getting a job overseas as a graphic designer. But that time I had discovered the work of the Dutch studio called Lava. One of Lava's creative directors was a Spanish designer called Luis Mendo. I emailed Luis and he let me know there was no positions available, but he was happy to allocate time to meet me and have a casual chat. So in 2003, I designed my first English business cards and I flew to Amsterdam to meet Luis and leave my folio at other design studios. Luis was incredibly generous with me. We conducted a non-official interview in Spanish where he asked me, do you speak English? And I said, si, si, English, si, but not Dutch. <laughs> then he asked me, why should I hire you? What can you offer me that no one else can? What makes you unique and different from anyone else? I was 25 years old and I froze. A while ago, I listened to a podcast called Debbie Millman and the questions you need to ask yourself. And it reminded me very much that chat from 2003. Meeting Luis was a milestone experience and it was my first baby step towards much bigger challenges. A few months after my experience in Amsterdam, my grandfather passed away. And my father told me he had left some money for me. But he would only give me the money if it was going to be invested in education. I debated myself between studying English overseas or upskilling my web design knowledge. And in the end, I decided to enroll for a master's degree in user interface design. I applied to the program a few days the course had started and I thought I had absolutely no chances to get in. But the director of the course got in touch and scheduled an interview straight away. I remember talking to her about the program and asking how many students are in class. And she said, 11 plus you. So I said, oh cool, so we are 12. She said, no, 11 plus you. The next day, I went to class to discover that we were 11 boys and I. I had been admitted straight away into the program based on the fact that I was a girl and they wanted it or they needed it at least one. Most of my classmates were from other countries and a few classes were conducted in English and I was totally lost. This time was my second expo exposure to many nationalities after New York City and the third reminder that learning English was a must. Soon after I finished my master's degree, a tech company got in touch as they were looking for designers to become part of a very, very cool interdisciplinary studio. I passed successfully my first two interviews and the third and last one was conducted in English. So guess what happened? <laughs> Obviously, I did not get it. Job. <laughs> so, finally, after 29 years, I finally found the courage to pack my bag and book a one-way ticket overseas. 
I landed in Australia in 2006, and a few weeks later, I moved to a shared house with three Australian boys. I couldn't understand more than half of what they were telling me. My housemates were using a slang and colloquialisms from a very icon iconic Australian movie that I had never heard of. A year later, when my English was a lot better, we all sat down one night on the couch and they screened the famous Australian movie for me. After spending an entire year thinking that I would never get the Australian humor, I finally got to discover where all these expressions came from and I laughed at every single joke of that movie. And then my housemates told me, now you are one of us. <laughs> Many of us live in a constant tension between being unique and wanting to belong. In the creative industries, the line between belonging and competing against each other can be very, very fine. This is my co-working studio in Melbourne called Rodson's. In my experience, having people around you that respect, support your work, and understand the mindset of a freelance designer is very, very important. Being, being surrounded by people that inspire your work and being able to collaborate with them is one of the greatest advantages of our industry. So please, take it. Be generous. Share your knowledge, connect, collaborate, and support the shit out of each other. My time in Australia wasn't easy, actually. I felt lost, and I wasn't proud of my work at all. I considered stop being a designer many, many times, but not knowing what to do instead, I focused on my next dream life goal, which was traveling. Finally, I could at least uh, speak English, so there was nothing else uh, stopping me except the money. I work out how much money would I need for a very, very cheap 12 months sabbatical. Divided by the amount of money I could save up every month, giving me, as a result, the amount of months I needed to keep working till reaching my target. 10 months and $20,000 later, I was booking flights to more than 13 countries around the world with the intention of not doing absolutely any design work. My career crisis lasted nearly two years. I knew my graphic design work was okay, but definitely wasn't exceptional. I was sick of designing business cards and stationary design, and I couldn't imagine doing it any longer. So in the end, I decided to go back to study and look for an specialization. In 2011, I flew back to Barcelona for six months to study a postgrad in advanced typography, followed by a condensed program in typeface design where I first met Jean-Francois Pochers. This one in here is my first attempt at typeface design in Barcelona while studying with Gina Sarret here today and having Laura Masegue and un Jose Mauros as our main instructors. This one in here is my second attempt at typeface design while studying at Typepad Cooper in New York City and having Jean-Francois Pochez and Stéphane Elvaz as our main instructors. Now, the image I'm gonna show you now, it might look super, super familiar to the ones currently doing this condensed program. <laughs> this is 2012, and this one belongs from the graduation day with my teachers, which I love, <laughs> is seven years. Wow, yeah. Now, from 2011 to 2013, I worked closely with a fashion designer friend of mine, designing textiles for international fashion houses, such as Zara, Mango, Massimo Dutti, and Uterque, among others. During these two years, I designed 432 prints, some of them Simple, but others, not so much. This project introduced me to the world of textile design and illustration in general, adding a huge new passion into my creative practice. This project also introduced me to being self-taught for the very first time. As everything I know today about textiles, I've learned it from my bedroom in Melbourne with the help of Google and YouTube. 
At the end of 2014, I was offered a textile design teaching position. And on the same year, I decided to start teaching calligraphy from my studio in Melbourne. For my surprise, being a teacher has been the best way for me to keep learning. And it has helped me to become a better student as I'm not afraid anymore about asking a million questions. I have been teaching independently for the past five years and I cannot recommend it enough. Sharing your passion and knowledge with others is one of the most rewarding things I do in my practice and I recommend it to all of you. In 2014, I started my first personal project, mixing my passion for illustration with my passion for surface patterns and my passion for lettering. So this first piece is called Bloody Maria and is followed by a second illustrated cocktail artwork called Gin Tonic. This second piece is my tribute and love story with the city of Barcelona as gin and tonics have been the drink per excellence in recent years. This project grabbed quite a bit of attention and in 2015, a cocktail venue in Melbourne offered me to host my first solo exhibition. These are two color adaptations of the full color artworks and these are a couple of images from the opening night called Breaking the Ice. In 2016, I started my second personal project, obviously called The Sheet Series. This project kick-started by my, my fascination with language and the colloquial ways Australian people use the word sheet. At that time, I found myself constantly asking my friends, what does this mean? like in this example in here, which means to fall very badly. I realized that my friends were using many, 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 many expressions with the word shit, both having negative and positive meanings. I decided to start a shit list and told all my friends I was working on this project so I would constantly receive messages from my friends telling me, do you have this one already? And explaining me the meaning. The shitty list grew up really quickly, and I decided to use all these expressions into a biographical way, explaining situations of feelings I was having at each time. Like in this case here, describing my feelings before my first conference talk in Australia at Typism. Or this one in here, describing how nervous I was at my Australian citizenship test. Or this one in here, talking about my feelings during the Catalan referendum. Or this one here describing the weather in Melbourne. And if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. Because <laughs> it's pretty crazy. Now, believe it or not, this project is actually inspired by my Catalan Christmas celebrations. In Catalonia, in Christmas, we celebrate something called the cagatio. A cagatio is a Christmas log standing on wooden stick legs, sheeting, Christmas presents. <laughs> and I'm not cheating you. <laughs> um, the tío has a very happy face and wears a red barretina hat. The kids start feeding the tío on the 8th of December all the way till Christmas Eve. And on Christmas Eve, the kids sing the cagatío song while whipping the log with a stick. The song ends with cagatío which is a command for the log to sheet presents. <laughs> in Catalonia during Christmas time, we also celebrate something called a cagané. A cagané is a small figurine of a person squatting down with lower pants sheeting. We believe that the cagané represents the equality of all people because everyone poos. And it might reinforce the idea that baby Jesus is actually God in human form as the Kagane is part of our Christmas nativity scene. Now, by now, this figurine has many, many modern iterations, and by now, you can actually find any type of celebrity <laughs> represented. Now, my sheet series actually have taught me a lot of Australian slang, and I closed this project at the end of last year, having completed 100 personal posts. 
Now, releasing a font commercially has been on my to-do list since I first studied typeface design. As I mentioned to you earlier on, in 2015, I worked on a series of illustrated cocktail artworks, including a French one called Absinthe. The lettering of Absinthe got stuck on my mind, and a year later, I decided to draw the rest of the 26 characters of the uppercase alphabet. I started 2017 having my two calligraphy courses sold out, so I took this amazing opportunity to devote myself to this project for nine months straight. My baby is called Green Fairy. I purchased the software Gleaves and I started working on it. Things were going pretty good till I arrived to the dots white. I started drawing squares fo following a grid. Then the squares turned into diamonds. Then the grid wasn't working so well on the round shapes, so I decided to randomize the position of the dots, but it didn't work. So I went back to the grid and I scaled down the size of the diamonds, creating a half-tone effect. I spent over four weeks full-time only working on the dots' weight. I kept encountering problems, but I kept redrawing readjusting, retweaking, redrawing, readjusting, retweaking. But and then, of, of course, the diacritics came on board. And then more spacing, then the numbers, then the currency symbols, then some kerning. Nine months, and many crises, nine months full time and many crises later, I could confidently share that my green fairy phone was coming to life as a chromatic phone family highly ornamented for display purposes. This means that every layer is stuck on top of each other to create multiple chromatic styles. Green fairy has four chromatic weights, the outline, the dots, the stencil and the full, and the outline works as a basal structure for all the other weights. Green Fairy has also three combined weights called combos for all these occasions where you only want to use one single color in your font. This project has been one of the toughest things I have ever worked on. It has tested my patience and determination, and I have been on the edge of quitting multiple times. When I talked to my parents about this project, I knew they would not understand what I'm doing, so I told them that I was publishing a book <laughs> <laughs> so that they could picture the magnitude of the project. <laughs> In September 2017, I decided to submit my phone files to a phone reseller. I was extremely naive about the whole process, and I'm going to share it with all of you. I remember stating on my, su my, my submission email I'm giving a talk in four weeks' time, and I would like to know whether or not it's possible to know if you are interested in publishing my phone before my talk. Is that possible? And the answer came back to me pretty quickly. <laughs> Two months after my submission email, they got back to me telling me that the answer was going to take two more months. November was really tough month for me, as I lost faith on this project and all my hopes of getting this font commercially available before the end of 2017. At this point, actually, the hardest part was the internal dialogue with myself, having to listen my own voice telling me that it was too hard, that I was not going to be able to make it, or that it was a total waste of time. This time, I pushed through and I stopped feeding the beast, but it is not always like that. Six months after my submission email, I was finally granted as a new font foundry called Maria Montes. And recently, my green fairy font has turned one year old. So, yes. Thank you. As most of you know in this room, typeface design is extremely time consuming and it requires a lot of hard work and determination. Up to now, I haven't found any other Australian women who's, com who's uh, commercially published a font, 
So if you know of any, please let me know because I would learn, I would like to learn more about them. Now this font has been a nine months full-time personal investment and I wanted to share the entire process with you in case I'm helping to anyone in this room to also stop feeding your own beasts. Now my Green Fairy Fund has brought me an amazing opportunity. A couple of years ago, the Art Center La Panera in Spain offered me to host a retrospective solo exhibition focused on my last five years of personal and creative and professional practice. Obviously, following my fascination with language and colloquialisms, I decided to marry my cheat series with my Catalan eschatological background. If you are not familiarized with eschatology, this is pretty much what it means. <laughs> now, as you can imagine, the title of my exhibition is What a Shit Show. <laughs> and it's building a bridge between my country of birth and my country of residence. This exhibition featured four walls where I was talking about the art of drinking, the art of eating, the art of peeing, and the art of pooing. <laughs> now, especially for this exhibition, I decided to create a collection of 21 posters displaying my font in use in typical Catalan expressions, like this one. Starting with the theme of peeing, this means the person who pees on pine trees which in Catalan is referring to a city slicker in the country. Following the theme of eating, this poster means who eats hours, sheets, clocks. Following the theme of drinking, I'm going to show you a range of packaging with my fr green fairy font in use applying to an a commercial environment. This is my range of white, red, and rosé wines named after the, their native grapes. This is my range of liquors, uh, starting with letter A for Aujardente, something typical from Galicia, very similar to an Italian grappa. With letter R, traditional from Catalonia, is a walnut liquor. With letter C, is coffee liquor, and with letter S, is sangria, which you all know what it is. And then this is my range of non-alcoholic beverages, starting with olive oil, and something traditional, I believe, also in France, which is a sparkling water. Especially for that solo exhibition, I decided to create a couple of artworks representative of the Catalan culture, starting with a vermouth. Traditionally in Catalonia, vermouths were meant to open the appetite before a big meal. Most vermouths have a sweet taste, so we combine them with salty snacks to balance the palate. Like in this case, I'm combining the drink with clams and olives. The message for this piece is saying that you can drink a vermouth at any time of the day and not only as an aperitif as originally. My second artwork is called Chin Chin. Cava is a sparkling wine from Spain using native grapes. While doing research for this artwork, I found the popular sentence by Coco Chanel that says, I only drink champagne in two occasions, when I'm in love and when I'm not. So I decided to use this message into the piece and do my own adaptation. Now, this uh, exhibition last year meant a lot to me because it gave me the opportunity of showing my work to my family for the very first time. In this exhibition, I feature my textile design work, my font work, and the full color artworks, cocktail artworks, and my black and white lettering, as well as a few calligraphic pieces. Two weeks after the opening of the show, I got an email from another museum of modern art telling me that they were interested in traveling my show. Incredible, really, incredible. Um, two months later, I got the approval. So two weeks ago, I was in Spain opening my second solo exhibition, this time, in a museum in front of me the Mediterranean Sea, and this time three times bigger than last year. Now, the exhibition uh, featured my illustration work on skateboards, which I will talk about now, my textile design work, my black and white lettering, my full color artworks, my font, and 
my Catalan eschatology versus my sheet series, which is the cultural bridge I am pretending to build between my two cultures. Now, talking about love, today my partner and I are celebrating our 11th anniversary together. For our sixth anniversary, I decided to create a couple of skateboard decks just for fun, as my boyfriend used to be a skater and now only collects decks due to an injury. This is our house in Melbourne. We have about 46 decks hanging from one of the walls. Now, the two decks I started combine the same message. This one says our first six years together, and it was done directly on boot using a fine liner. Three years later, I decided to do another pair of decks. The message in this one says for the next nine years together, and I decided to combine our native uh, flora from Australia, being the eucalyptus tree and the palm trees, with my native nature, which is like the Mediterranean pine trees. Now, for last year's exhibition, I thought it was an amazing opportunity to extend this series, so I decided to do another pair of decks for our 10th anniversary. The idea behind these decks is that in a long relationship, there are plenty of beautiful memories, but others that when recalling them, they still hurt. And this is represented by the beauty of flowers and spiky cactus. This is how the decks were displayed last year on my first solo. And then for this year, obviously, I'm like, I'm gonna do this again. <laughs> so today is actually our anniversary. So these decks have the same message in English and in Catalan, which is 11 years together. And the idea behind these decks is the popular sentence that says the secret to a happy marriage is a very good sense of humor and a short memory, <laughs> represented by goldfish. <laughs> These decks are also done with a fine liner um, using a Moloto marker on top of it. Now, this is how the decks were displayed. Is these are how the decks are displayed currently at my exhibition. If you're planning to make your way to Barcelona, by any chance, this exhibition is one hour south. And is gonna be open till the 25th of August, just in case you are gonna be going there. Now, I would like to pause for a sec, just to reflect that I also study at Typeface Design, as I told you before. If someone told me seven years ago while studying a condensed program in Typeface Design that I will have three solo exhibitions, one in Australia and two in Spain, and I would give three conference talks, two in Australia and one in Paris, I would never believe it. Now, this is real life, and not everything is great and amazing, <laughs> so let's go into the dark. <laughs> In September last year, I was diagnosed with a melanoma on my face. Five, five weeks later, I was facing a plastic surgery to reconstruct the left-hand side of my nose. The weeks approaching my surgery were dark and nothing seemed to matter anymore. Four days after my surgery, my doctor called me to tell me that the results from three different biopsies said that the melanoma was now gone. By mid-November, I was back at my studio, but mentally it took me much longer. It was a painful reminder of not taking health for granted, never ever. This experience made me reconsider many things again, like freelance life, financial stability, work-life balance, if that exists, and friendships. My health problems made me look for more security. So at the end of last year, I accepted a casual teaching position at university. In February this year, I started to, to teach lettering and typography at RMIT University in Melbourne. As any new job, the first weeks were really stressful, trying to be on top of everything and trying to be, trying to remember more than 100 student names. Being surrounded by so much diversity made me reflect on my own um, background and upbringing. At the age of 16, I had my first non-traditional meal at a Chinese restaurant, and I thought that this was the best thing ever. Fast forward 20 years later, 
I live in Australia where more than the 28% of us have been born overseas in over 200 countries where a quarter of the population speak more than 160 languages, 260 languages other than English at home, and where more than 50% of Australians follow more than 130 different faiths. And in this context, I found myself surrounded by young students who will become the next generation of designers and thinkers, and I'm hoping that our international design community will truly represent the numbers above. As a woman and educator, I feel the responsibility of spreading this message across by supporting cultural diversity, celebrating women in the industry, highlighting the importance of gender equality and inclusion, and by making sure we all understand that by bringing more voices, colors, and underrepresented groups up on the stage, can only open up our view of the world and make us better. This talk, with this talk, I wanted to show you that isolating my work does not define me, but my whole journey does. My past, my present, my family, my environment, and especially my choices, the whole lot. Now, to conclude with this talk, I would like to add something. Letter forms are a tool for communication. We now have access to multiple platforms where we can amplify our voice and talk about the issues we really care about. I ask myself these questions many times. Wha what, what is the reason why you are designing? What are the impacts of your work? What is the legacy you want to leave behind in this visual culture? What responsibility do we in the design sector half. As designers, we translate our clients' ideas. As artists, we become the vehicle of our own ideas. Are we using our knowledge and skills for designing for good? Merci, Paris. Thank you, Maria. It was really emotional and intense. So I already got two questions for you to warm it up a little bit. So the first one is uh, you talk about how important it is to share this passion with people. But what about places? As far as I know, you lived in Barcelona, in New York, now in Melbourne, so three different cities in three different countries. How much the environment influ is influencing your work or influenced the process that um, in becoming who you are right now and what you are doing today? A lot. <laughs> a lot. Um, everything I did as a personal work only started in Australia. So without having the Australian experience, I probably wouldn't be here. Uh, my environment is one of the main fuels for me to create what I do. Like I normally get inspired by the everyday, like the people around me, the people I work with, especially the people I meet, and the nature. Like as you see in my work, there is heaps of organic shapes and a lot of detail, and this is heavily influenced by the nature in Australia. So to me, where I live, it does matter a lot because it, it does impact a lot of my work. And the second one is, uh, you are a lettering artist as well as a textile designer. How much and in which way letter forms are influencing the designs and the patterns you draw for clothes? Hmm. Or it's the other way around? It's maybe the other way around. I don't know if lettering has an influence on my textile design work, but I think my textile design work has had an impact on my lettering work probably. I don't know, for me, for me, color is really important. A lot of my work is super colorful and I guess it's not a coincidence that my font is actually a chromatic font. <laughs> I guess this is, has been translated into my typography work. 
I find that working on type makes my eye being extremely fit because you need to be looking at m massive detail. And so when then these translate into textiles, you can actually see everything from a sort of new and better perspective as you can identify the foreground and the background as two things that are really, really important. I think without having this strong background of calligraphy and lettering and typography, I would not have this sense of how these two elements interact. So when I am creating patterns, my eye is sort of like really fit because it's coming from that black and white environment of the type. And of course, uh, I guess the painful thing about type for me is that I have to be in an environment of black and white a lot when I'm like craving for some color. So one of these uh, skateboards that I designed happened because I was going through the, my font for many, many months. And I'm normally someone that feels really bored really quickly, so I need to be jumping. And so I was working on the phone straight for months and I was going a bit like, and so I thought I just need to step back. And the second pair of decks happened because of that as a counter reaction of like, I need to stop for just two, s two weeks, I think. I stopped for two weeks to jump on decks and to work with color and just take a big, like a step back a little bit because it was like really intense into this black and white environment. So um, I don't know if I answered you, but. Mm. No, <laughs> okay, that's fine. Anyone has a question? Here it is. Uh, hi. Um, I know you said a couple times that it got really difficult, like when you first moved to Australia, that it was hard, or um, also when you were working on the, your typeface and having a lot of crises. I'm just wondering what it is that you do that you find is helpful to bring you out of spiraling into crisis mode and it's not working and this is too hard and how do you keep yourself motivated? That's an awesome question. <laughs> yeah, I have had many moments and I don't know, I always tell myself I'm super stubborn because for me the idea of giving up is not an idea. Actually, I don't give myself the option. Uh, yes, Australia wasn't easy because I didn't speak English and obviously I, wasn't, I was very far away from home but I was determined of having a really intense experience and I did actually have it. And there was many moments where I thought, you know, I could be much closer to home and live. Um, I just didn't give up at that time. I just uh, stayed there really strong and I thought, you know, I can always go back so I just keep pushing a little bit more and maybe, maybe it's really bad then at the end, okay, I will leave. With my type, with my font, the first typeface that you have seen, I have tried to finish that font and I couldn't. It was too much for me. So I was already like, okay, I couldn't do that, move on. With the second typeface that I show you, I tried to finish that and I couldn't. And I felt really bad about it because I'm like, I don't normally leave things unfinished, but the font was bigger than myself and I couldn't finish it. Now, when I decided to go into the third one, it was just like a, this is a pure obsession. Because I was, I was turning 40 years old, and one of the, my old-time influences is W.A. Dwiggins, and I knew he released his first phone in his 40s. And to me, it was just an obsession at that point. <laughs> also, unofficially, they asked me to feature my font into a book. And I didn't tell them it was not a font. <laughs> <laughs> it was only a typeface with a few characters drawn, A to Z. But they told me, we really love your font. And I was like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and then they said, you need to feature, we are gonna feature one day of the calendar. So you need to give us the layout with the 5th of December. I had no numbers designed. So I designed number five only to be featured on that publication. I only had number five done. <laughs> then I submitted too late because I was designing number five, especially for that publication. So it took me a long time. I submitted it and it was a bit late. And the guy said, I'm sorry, I thought you didn't want to join. So we already have someone for the 5th of December. So I'm gonna give you the 12th of April. And I said, no, you are not, you are not 
because I have a million deadlines, I have a lot of projects, I cannot devote myself to another day for this publication, so please accept my work. And my work is the 5th of December. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, okay, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Now, this made me to have a real deadline because up to that point, that was a few characters drawn, that's it. But then I said, this is a font and this is published. So I asked the, the person, when is this calendar gonna be published? And he said, in December 2017. And that was January 2017. So the next morning, I purchased the software glyphs, literally, and I said, that's it. I said, it's a font and I'm not gonna lie. So uh, it has to be a font now. And I had the real deadline to do it. That's why when the phone reseller didn't reply my emails and the end of the year concluded, I was like, I've done all of this crazy stuff and my font is not gonna be released by the time of the publication. But hey, my font was released in April, four months later, and I think people don't hate me for that. <laughs> Maybe no one even looked for the font but it was the real pressure of having to have it because I said it's a font and then it means it's going to be a font. B look for a very big excuse to finish work <laughs> like that. Yeah, that's it. Uh, hi, first of all, thank you for the talk. It was really inspiring. And Sorry? It, the talk was really inspiring. And thank you. Uh, I wanted to, I kind of noticed that a lot of your work revolves around wordplay, especially when it comes to lettering, like Breaking the Ice and then your cocktail series and then obviously the shit series. So since it's your second language, it's very difficult to kind of understand something that's so local and colloquial. So I wanted to ask, is that something you consciously tried to do with your projects? Like, like the shit series, you were actually collecting the different ways that these words were used uh, you know, in different contexts. So is that something you did consciously for all of your projects or is that something you found happening when you learned the language better or? I don't think it was conscious, but with the cocktail artworks, there is a lot of jokes with language. And this is, yes, it's conscious because I want to bring humor into my artworks and this is deliberate. So I always try to provoke a little smile because I feel that when there is a little bit of humor, you suddenly connect with the artwork into a deeper level. So the, hu the humor is intentional. Uh, the language, not so much. You asked me before about how do I go through. Um, after my first solo exhibition, I was really down. And it was my first solo exhibition, so I didn't know this is actually a thing. Like, I finished the exhibition, I went back to work, and I didn't have any energy. I thought, I, I don't feel like working, I'm not motivated, I don't have ideas, and then I started to get really worried because I was asking myself, what's wrong with me, what's wrong with me, what's wrong with me? Then I talked to an artist and he said to me, yeah, Maria, this is called post-exhibition blues. <laughs> you open an exhibition and go down the hill, and it takes a few weeks or months to go up. I didn't know about that. I, I didn't en know anything. I was going into this dark, moment where I didn't have any energy and motivation. And then I was um, one day with my partner's father and he was chatting about something and he said, shit will hit the fan. And I said to him, what does that mean? And he said, means that shit is going everywhere. And that's how I felt. I felt exactly like that. I felt like shit is going everywhere for my life. And I didn't have any ideas to do anything, so I grabbed the sentence, and I just lettered the sentence. Sh shit will hit the fan because I was feeling like that. Then I heard another expression another day randomly, and I just lettered the same because I wasn't having any ideas to do anything else. So I was just grabbing another expression, and I did it. And then a friend of mine texted me and told me, I love your shit series. And I'm like, what? And then I went home and I thought about it for two days and I texted her back and I said, oh yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, my shit series. <laughs> and that was the beginning of a hundred posts. So no, it wasn't delivered, but it happened. Someone else? No? Okay. 
So, Jean Francois. I don't have questions to Maria. Oh, okay. Just I'm so happy to have you here. To see you since seven years, going in a lot of different direction, but still with the same strengths inside you. And to see you, <coughs> when I recall having you with us for five weeks, drawing your letters, and have some trouble to make them correct discussing together and, um, and now uh, when I see your ability to, e to express to the people your emotion or to work with what you have inside and to, to be able to share that, that process that everybody have but it's so difficult for the normal person to express their feeling they have inside uh, very very deeply inside of that we all have everyone but you find you, you, you have the right word to explain that. And I feel, um, I feel that kind of emotion when I walk. So you see, <laughs> thank you. Thank you.